Hello, everyone. Welcome to Base Camp, a climbing magazine podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Riley. Thank you for tuning in. This is the Gear Guide episode. For all you gearheads out there, this one's for you. And it is a packed episode. First, James Lucas and I sit down to chat about the upcoming issue, including Color the Crag, an event to increase the presence of people of color outside, encourage community leadership, and provide positive representation of climbing and physical activity among people of color. James attended the first ever event at Horse Pens 40 and wrote about in the upcoming Gear Guides, The Place Department. We also talk about Roy, New Mexico, a newish bouldering destination that James has been frequenting a lot as of late, and we talk about the latest and greatest gear that James reviewed in the Gear Guide. Then Climbing's digital editor, Kevin Corrigan, interviews Colin Powick, Black Diamond's Climbing Category Director. They sat down at the outdoor retailer Snow Show earlier in the year and chat about what it's like to have a dream job in the industry, how climbing products are developed at BD, how the new C4s came to be, and Kevin Corrigan pitches a few of his own creative, shall we say, climbing product ideas. And stick around for a bonus off-topic interview and performance from the artist behind Basecamp's theme song, Jeremy Quinton of Small Houses. He was recently in Boulder and Denver on tour to support his new album, I Don't Know What's Safe. You can find the album and more information about Small Houses at smallhouses.band. So we're going to get after it. But first, a word from our sponsor. All right. You're locked in. Your hands locked. Your knot looks good. Double back. You got hands. You got slings. You got some nuts. Ready to rock and roll. Sweet, man. Climbing. Climb on. This episode is presented by Black Diamond Equipment. The world's best-selling, most trusted cam just got better. Now 10% lighter, these bad boys feature a more modern design that gives climbers everything they love about the old Camelots with new touch points like a wider trigger for easier handling and an innovative trigger keeper for compact racking with sizes number 4, number 5, and number 6. For more information about the redesigned Camelot C4s, visit blackdiamondequipment.com. I'm with you. Right, following. Roger. Oh man, nice fall. Uh, that was thin up there. Yeah, he slipped out of it, huh? That was getting tough. Black Diamond. Live, climb, repeat. Okay, here with James Lucas. How you doing? I'm good. It's like that it's Friday, right for the weekend. <laughs> I assume you're going to be heading back to Roy, New Mexico, maybe? Yeah, as soon as I'm done with work. I've been going pretty much like every weekend since mid-January. And why are you going so much? What's the fascination? Well, like the... The bouldering in in Roy in northeastern New Mexico is really good. It's uh-huh. like quiet. There's no self service. It's like completely off the grid. And uh, yeah, the climbing is just great. There's a bunch of sandstone roofs. There's like a couple like areas with thirty foot roofs. There's a bunch of high ball boulder problems. There's a lot of really cool compression stuff. And it's new and it's just great to get out of boulder for the weekend get away from the office is there a good selection of grades yeah i would say that like the moderate grades like v zero to v three are really good Mm -hmm. and then um the stuff from like v4 to v8 is also really good Uh Uh, there's harder climbing than that but probably not quite as much as an area like Rocky Mountain National Park or Waco. But there's a lot of development going on, and so uh-huh. Roy's becoming quite good. And what's the camping scene like? It's primitive camping. There's a there's a campground, the Mills Campground, and there's a, there's a pit toilet, and uh, that's it. There's no running water. You got burning water. Uh, some people get cell phone service, but... Not very many. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, the nearest grocery store is in Springer. And it's it's not like an amazing facility. So uh-huh. it's good to like drive in with groceries as well. Great, great. So let's talk about the gear guide. You wrote a piece called The Color of the Crag, mm-hmm. which was a nice little article. Can you maybe give me a little bit of background about that event? <clears throat> yeah, so uh, last October, Nina Williams, my girlfriend, was invited to teach some clinics and participate in this event color the crag and uh i tagged along because i wanted to check it out i met uh Mikkel martin who's one of the organizers he's also one of the leaders of brothers of climbing uh-huh. and him and along with bethany lebowitz who runs brown girls climb they organized 
this event at Horse Pens 40. It was the second time they did it, done it, and it's just a. Uh, their whole aim is to increase the presence of people of color outside, encourage community leadership, and provide positive representation of climbing, mm-hmm. physical activities among populations of color. That's their essential mission statement. And so what ends up being is uh, I think there are around 240 people of color from everywhere from San Francisco to Miami to Washington to New York City who uh-huh. just met for three days and tried to like build a greater sense of community within people of color mm-hmm. in climbing. What did you learn at the event? You know, like we don't have a whole lot of like statistics for climbing, like what the demographics of climbing are. Uh huh. But it's a pretty good idea that it's mostly like white Caucasian male. Sure. Whereas like the population of the United States is not mostly white Caucasian male. Mm-hmm. And so ideally like climbing would reflect the actual population. And so what the event showed me was just like how they're, how it's trying to be open to uh, bringing other people into the sport uh-huh. and uh, what ways. And one of their big ideas was, to create a community. Sure. And also just to show like other people of color that like you can climb outside. Mm-hmm. You you can like rock climbing is a thing for you. Yeah. And I think the representation is a big part of that. Mm-hmm. You know, if you grow up and you're looking at climbing media or seeing stuff on TV with climbers and it's all white male. Yeah. You it, might think it's, oh, that's not for me. Mm-hmm. When in reality, climbing's for everybody. Yeah, exactly. Mikhail Martin said, like, it said that, like, this demographic had always shown that, like, that people of color were alone, that the outdoors and rock climbing weren't for them. Mm -hmm. And that's not really true. It's just, like, trying to show that. Yeah. So. That's cool. Yeah, it was was a great event. Um, Like, the climbing down in the south is amazing. Sure. Um, And the... The event itself was one of the the best I've been to. They had um, this great musician who played on uh, NPR's Tiny Desk, uh, Daycon Sue. Mm-hmm. And then um, James Edward Mills, who, who runs the Joy Trip Project, he spoke about the, the adventure gap, like why minority populations are less likely to seek outdoor recreation. And they had like a, a dance party at the end. They had slacklining. They had a lot of like clinics talking about and panels talking about diversity and leadership. It was an incredible event. And the the climbing down there is amazing too. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it was it was pretty hard to be. I was I was really psyched to be able to tag along and check uh-huh. it out. And did you find some time to climb yourself as well? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, I I always make that a priority. I'm like ah, yeah. like uh, one night, uh, Shelma June, who runs Flash Foxy, and uh-huh. I we like while everybody was eating dinner, we like took off. I I brought some headlamps and I packed up um, my CO lights, and um, we went bouldering at night. It was really cool. Nice. Yeah, and then all of a sudden we heard like. Um, people singing in the pavilion like shouting out the lyrics to soldier boy we were like oh man we're missing the party (laughs) we packed up our crash pads and went back and uh hung out at the dance party cool cool all right well let's talk about the gear guide a little bit and talk about gear Mm -hmm. you know the whole editorial team and the team of testers have been hard at work testing you know everything from crash pads to cams to clothing yeah, I reviewed a lot of um, bouldering stuff this past uh-huh. year because I've been bouldering a lot. And I checked out this Metolius Recon pad. Uh, Organic is making a new airline pad, which is small enough to like check it as baggage, which is great for trips to like you're flying to Waco for a long weekend or you're flying to Font or Rocklands. This is a crash pad that you can actually like take with you. Uh, I used the Rhino Skin Repair mm-hmm. a bunch, which I really liked. Uh, actually gave that an editor's choice that just like makes my skin a lot better after uh, climbing Mm -hmm. Um, also checked out one of my favorite things was the tension uh, block 
it's kind of like a, a one hand hangboard essentially, mm-hmm. but you can attach weights to it. It's got like a six millimeter cord that runs through the, the block. And so you can uh, attach it to a cable machine at the gym, or you can like hang it from a tree and like kind of do one arm hangs on it. It's got a bunch of different edges. There's a 10 millimeter edge, a seven millimeter edge. There's like a 25 millimeter edge. Uh, you can pinch it. There's uh, two pockets. And so there's a lot of different hand positions. You can use it to like warm up uh-huh. or you can like throw in your backpack and um, when you're traveling and use yeah. it to do uh, kind of like a hang, not quite, you're not hanging. It's not like a hangboard routine, but it's the same idea. Your hand's just hanging straight down and you can do like finger curls with it. Oh, okay. And you can kind of like hold your fingers in the position uh-huh. that's uh, similar to a hangboard, but it requires less space. That's cool. I haven't seen anything like that yeah, before. Yeah, yeah. It's really good. I think that there's another company that's making a similar one called mm-hmm. Gripple. Okay. I haven't checked it out, but I hear that one's pretty good too. And how are you using it most often? I've been using it at home, uh, attaching weights to it. Uh-huh. And uh, I started a, like a finger strengthening routine for the to get ready for the summer alpine season so it's like okay i'm getting uh hang the 10 millimeter edge and then i can clip like a certain amount of weight to it Mm -hmm. like 10 pounds and then i'll try and like hold the 10 pounds for seven seconds and then uh then rest and then slowly increase the weight as well as the like reps cool Can we talk about, can we talk about crash pads for a second? Yeah, sure. Because, you know, one thing I'm fascinated about is, you know, all the different styles of Mm -hmm. crash pads. And when I first got into bouldering, it kind of seemed to me like, oh, you just need a crash pad to go bouldering. But really there's so many different uses for crash pads. And it seems like just like climbing shoes, you almost want like a whole quiver of crash pads for different (laughs) situations. Yeah, I I would say that that's true for sure like my my girlfriend she really likes climbing high balls Uh and so it's like okay well you want to do your high ball project we better like bust out the the five inch thick like organic foam pads they're like super simple Mm -hmm. um but they're they're heavy but they're they're great to land on whereas i'm like oh like i i've got some project in the park and then it's like oh well I've got this Asana pad and uh, it's got a really good carry system Mm -hmm. and it's lighter. It's fairly big, but I can like drape it over talus. And then I've got uh, a couple of smaller ones, like a a smaller Metolius pad that also like fits better in talus. And sometimes you want like a really thin pad, like a kick pad. Yeah. And so you kind of like want a couple different options for pads. Mm -hmm. Um, for different situations like yeah. depending on where you climb a lot like you might want something lighter so you can carry it around like in horse pens 40 you you don't need like five inches of foam underneath you uh-huh you just need like one small pad that's like easy to fold up easy to put all your stuff in like bd makes a great pad for that or you might want something like a little bigger if you're climbing at uh flagstaff and then you, you could bust out the Metolius Recon, which is a trifold pad. And it has like, like a little more coverage. But uh-huh. it's also like pretty light and not a big deal to carry out there. Cool. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, James. Appreciate it. Cool. Yeah, no problem. Boy, that was fun. I love the gear guide. It's my favorite issue of the year. Make sure to pick up your own copy. They go on sale March 13th. You can find them at specialty retailers, climbing gyms, and bookstores across the country. Or better yet, go to climbing.com and subscribe online. All right, moving forward, our digital editor, Kevin Corrigan, sits down with Colin Powick, Black Diamond's climbing category director. All you gearheads out there, you're going to love this, truly. This one's for you. So without further ado, Kevin and Colin. What is your background as a climber? How did you originally get started in the sport? I'm, well, I'm getting old. So I started climbing probably in the early 90s, in my early 20s, maybe 23, 24, which is late according to today's standards. But I'm from Canada, and I was near Toronto, living in Toronto. And then I moved out to Calgary, and then being so close to the mountains, just 
that was my thing. I just started climbing. Cool. Uh, I also got started at 25, so I always feel like I'm behind everyone else. Late bloomers, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Late bloomers. How did you originally get involved at Black Diamond? Uh, well, I moved, uh, my wife and I, we went on a one-year honeymoon in 1998 on a climbing road trip, and then we landed in Salt Lake City, and we never left. We moved there in 99, and I called up Black Diamond our first day there and asked, I, was a, I have a mechanical engineering background, and I asked if they were looking for any engineers, and they said no, and uh, good luck, uh, nobody ever leaves, and it's really hard to get in here. And I was like, okay. And then three years later, in 2002, they actually called me because they were looking for someone to run their quality department. So I've been there ever since. And what were you doing in the meantime in those three years? I was running a manufacturing operation that worked with uh, metal fab, basically. Just engineering background stuff and uh, just manufacturing kind of light duty metal work, basically. Is it, uh, you said it was, at the time you were applying, it was really hard to get a job at BD and no one ever left. Is that still the case there? It is still the case. It's, you know, it's a pretty in-demand place. But we have grown a lot since then, so it's different. It's still quite hard to get in there. Generally, people stay for quite a while. But the fact that we've been growing over the years makes it a little easier to try to get, to try to get in there. But just to put it in perspective, when I was running the quality department and we would post a job for an entry-level mechanical engineer right out of school, we would get upwards between two and 300 applicants. You know? wow. So it's, still, it's a competitive field out there for sure. Can you uh, talk a little bit about the history of Black Diamond for people who might not be familiar? Yeah, uh, don't quote me on the dates, but basically way back in the day, Yvonne Chouinard started a company called Chouinard Equipment where they made pitons basically in carabiners, sold them out of his car sort of thing. We've all seen the photos. And then at some point, he started importing clothing, and I think that was in the 70s, and then realized that he wanted to separate these two companies and he created a little company that we may know as Patagonia. So there was two companies uh, under the Yvonne Chouinard umbrella, Patagonia and Chouinard Equipment. And then in the late 80s, uh, there was a lawsuit where a climber was killed and Chouinard decided to fold Chouinard Equipment. So folded Chouinard Equipment, uh, Patagonia was totally separate. And at that time, Peter Metcalf was working for Chouinard and he rallied his friends and family and got a bunch of money and bought the assets from Yvonne Chouinard in 89 and created what's now known as Black Diamond. And it moved to Salt Lake in 1991 uh, from Ventura, California, and it's been there ever since. And I heard that there is an Easter egg in the Black Diamond logo that references Chouinard. There is. And if you have a Black Diamond logo in front of you, the history is way back in the day, these blacksmith type folks, they would all have an emblem that they would like emboss into their products that they made and in the Chenard days it was a C inside a diamond shape and then when uh, Metcalf and the crew formed Black Diamond they wanted to keep a little bit of that heritage and if you look at the Black Diamond logo the gap in the diamond is actually referencing the C from Chenard it's pretty cool yeah that's a good little tidbit. Yeah. Uh, so I think a lot of people would consider your job to be kind of a dream job. You're <laughs> the head of rock climbing for Black Diamond. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about what's what's an average day at your job look like? Yeah. Uh, well, like I have to tell my parents, it's still actually a job. Uh, it's not all rainbows and unicorns. But uh, yeah, it's hard to describe the average day. But my job as a climbing category director is basically to try to steer the direction of the climbing gear that we're making. And I'm involved from the product side, the sales side, and the marketing side. And I, I kind of joke that I don't actually do anything. We have an army of people that do all the work, and I'm just basically the guy that stands in front of people and spews about it. But, you know, we're looking to try and innovate and improve climbing gear. We have four categories in Black Diamond. There's the climbing gear, ski gear, mountain gear, uh, headlamps, trekking poles, that sort of thing, and then apparel. So there's these four kind of divisions, and I am solely involved in the climbing division. And in the climbing division, our goal is to make the best climbing gear in the world. It's, it's really that simple. And there's lots of competition out there nowadays, and we are just trying to help evolve climbing gear, making it lighter, making it stronger, making it easier to use. And you can see, if you just look back in the last 20 years, an ice tool, for example, from a straight-shafted bamboo forged head to carbon fiber and funky angles and all this stuff and the, the things that people are climbing nowadays you know that's what we're all pushing the limit with that kind of stuff so i want to get back to uh product design in a little bit but just to 
take a step back, you were talking about how even though it's a dream job, you know, it's still a job. There's good days or bad. There's bad days. I'm sure, you know, my job is similar. I get to write about rock climbing, but sometimes there's day that, days. A job's a job, you know. Sucks. We just happen to be doing something cool, but it's still a job for sure. Yeah, so what's what's a day that you don't look forward to at work look like? Uh, they just happen. You don't. I don't really know that there's a day where I'm going in where this is going to be a bad day, but it's just like anything. There's... Uh, we are just working on really cool stuff that we're really passionate about, and that's what makes it really fun, is that the whole crew, the whole team at Black Diamond is just super stoked and passionate about climbing gear, so we're psyched to be working on it. But there's deadlines, there's lots of meetings, there's uh, frustration, there's things being late, there's issues with production and issues with manufacturing. It's just all the standard stuff. So there's nothing, there's no particular thing like that I dread doing each day because this is you know it is a pretty great job to have for sure but it is a real job there's real stress and there's frustration and there's yelling and arguments and there's there's all that stuff and it's just because so many people have so much passion we want to make the best gear because it's us and our friends that are using this stuff you know if I was working on heart pumps or something like that I, I, I don't have a first-hand experience with that so I would just go in and plug away and work on a heart pump and go home but this is with a lot of us, it's really like a 24-7 job. I probably haven't gone climbing once in the last 16 years and not had some form of prototype on me that I'm emailing the designer from the crag about or taking photos of or whatever. Like, it's kind of you're always on. Do your engineers, are they, do they get worried when you go out to the cliff? They're like, oh, no, KP's going to send, send us some notes from the summit. Well, that's, I, thought you, I, thought, uh, I thought you were going to ask if they get worried that they're going to kill me because sometimes oh. that is a... Uh, that's a concern. Sometimes we have some prototypes and they're like, you know, hey, this is like super sketchy handmade prototype. So be careful. I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's fine. And then I'll go out and maybe push it a little too far. But uh, no, I mean, the feedback, the constant feedback from me and, and all the other folks, you know, like I said, we have a whole army of people at the, the company from per, people in the distribution center, people that answer the phones, the designers, some of the finance folks. Like we got climbers all over the place. So it's by no means is it just me that's using this gear. It's me and the designers are the first guys that use the prototypes because we know what's sketchy or whatever. Uh, but then eventually it'll go a little bit further outside the circle and get some feedback from other folks within the building. And the other side of the spectrum, what does a day at work look like where, where it really does look like the dream where everyone would be jealous? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, most days probably if most people looked inside uh, the office and saw what was going on day to day, they would probably think it's the dream. Like, it's kind of crazy. Sometimes I'll step outside myself and you're sitting in a meeting. You know, it's a, it can be a serious meeting, but you're talking about the latest crampon. And you're like, really? Am I really sitting here talking about the latest crampon? Like, is this my job? Or like, what color should this pack be? You know, stuff like that. Like, we have to think about that. What are you going to name this product? Like, there's all these things that... They don't just magically happen. There's a lot of energy that goes in behind it. But, you know, every day working with these guys and girls, you know, we got a bunch of ladies there too. But we have a really passionate, smart, I thought that the first day I, moved, I worked there is like, man, there's a lot of really smart people. Uh, so get to work with these guys and stand shoulder to shoulder and work on all this gear. It's pretty rad. And to be able, I love, I mean, I'm a gear guy, right? So I love having all the latest stuff and trying the latest stuff and climbing on the latest gear. Like, it's, it's pretty fun. Do you ever find that people are watching you in the gym to see, like, always. oh, is that a cool black diamond Always, prototype? always, yes. Especially in Salt Lake, you know, because people generally know who works at BD, and it's not just me by any means. But people are always looking at your harness and what do you have. So, we, I mean, we're not saving the world here, but we do want to keep stuff a little bit under wraps generally and try to keep stuff a little close to the chest and then show it to the consumers when we're good and ready. But, yeah, people are constantly looking at, what's on my feet or what's on my harness or what's on my head or jackets and, stuff and all that stuff for sure. So let's get into some product design. One thing I'm curious about is what is the very first step in designing a new piece of gear before, before someone's even opening a piece of software on their computer? Is it they're talking in the office like, we need a new carabiner? Yeah, exactly. So it's an idea. And we get ideas from all over the place, from within the building, of course, because we have lots of climbers and skiers in the building, by myself, the designers, anyone, anyone. Uh, but also we get people that just email in ideas. We get friends, like uh, we have a lot of friends that are climbers, of course. We get ideas from them. Athletes, we really try to tap into our athletes because they're climbing you know, as much as we would like to be climbing, but we're not. They're out there climbing full time. So they're using this gear all the time. So they're like, hey, man, you know, when I was using 
this ice tool, I really noticed that. And what if we did something like this? So we're, we're really tapping into these pro guys all the time. So the first step is basically an idea. It's like, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we could do a this or we could make a that, you know, that kind of thing. And then we may start noodling on that a little bit just to see if it's even a possibility. Is this something that we think would work? And then part of my job, a big part of my job is, you know, the reality is Black Diamond's a business. So we need to try to justify, is this a product that's going to be commercial? Is it manufacturable? Is it commercial? Can we make it? Can we sell it? How much are people going to pay for it? How many are we going to sell it? We have to think about all this stuff. So after we have an idea, we basically look at a business case. How much energy is it going to take in order to build this product? How many do we think we're going to sell? And we really map the whole thing out from a business perspective. And we go, okay, yes, this, this project is a go or it's not a go. So all that really happens before we pitch it to the design team and go, okay, we're going to work on this. Now it's an officially a project go. And at that point, it's started and it can go, but it can also die. You know, we have everything we start doesn't necessarily make it to market. It's like, okay, it's too complicated. The manufacturing processes were something that we weren't foreseen. It's going to be too expensive for the end consumer. Let's kill it or, or whatever. Let's go step by step through the design process for, I think, one of the most exciting new pieces of gear, uh, at least in my opinion, is the updated C4s yep. that are on their way. You know, Iconic Cam, what was the impetus for you guys being like, we can make this better? So that's a really good question. Let me go back to 2002 when I started. At that time, right after I started, we started a cam project. And the cams that most people know nowadays that have been out since 2004 that was one of the first projects that I started on as the director of quality. And at that time, we had the exact same discussion because the cams before that, they were great. And it was like, why screw up a good thing? What are we doing? So the goal was, okay, we need to take something that everybody knows and loves and we need to make it better and we can't screw it up. That was the goal. And we released those cams in 2004 after a bunch of testing, took a bunch of weight out. That's when we first came out with the uh, stainless steel thumb loop because before that it was those rigid, or not the rigid stems, but the thumb piece, not the thumb loop. So those cams have not been touched since 2004, and it's now 2019. So the 15-year run, that's pretty darn good for a piece of climbing gear to run 15 years without being touched. So when we had this discussion this time, we were like, okay, it's a competitive market out there. We haven't touched these cams in 15 years. We need to make them better. Number one priority, let's not screw it up. Everybody loves the C4s. We cannot screw it up. We sat with the design team and said, okay, what do we think we can do to make these things better? The number one thing in climbing gear nowadays is weight. You know, can we take some weight out? We have the ultralight cams, so that was kind of fit that slot, but we wanted to take our workhorse cams, make them a little bit lighter and make them function a little bit better. So it was really just a brainstorming session. The design guys, me, anyone, you know, that uses cams in the building, we're sitting down and we're just spitballing ideas on a, on a whiteboard Weight, of course, is the first one. And what can we do? Okay, head, the amount that the head wobbles. What if we use different thicknesses of stems to keep that equal from one cam to the other? What can we do with the sling? Do we do something different with the colors? Yes or no. The trigger keeper idea came up from one of our young guys who's a big desert climber, and he had this project that he was working in where he had to have a couple big cams, fives and sixes, on his harness. And he thought, what if I created this thing that held the cam retracted so it took less space on my harness? And he cobbled one together in the shop, took it out for the weekend, loved it, came back and pitched it to the design team. He wasn't actually even working on the cams. And he said, hey, what do you guys think about this? We're all like, yes, that is rad. So it really starts off as a blue sky brainstorm session with the overarching goal of, okay, we're going to keep the cams in the line. We just want to improve them without screwing it up and then take it from there. And then the design team starts working and then there's all these check-ins throughout the design process, you know, as these ideas come up. Some things fall off the back because they're too complicated or made too, co too costly because keeping the retail price similar or close to similar was important. Uh, reducing the weights was important. So that's kind of how it goes, not just with the cans, but with every project. It's like, what's the goal? What's the end goal? What do we need to do in order to make this thing successful? And then we just pick away at the list until we get there. And then once you have a design lockdown, what happens then? So, yeah, I mean, building one of anything is kind of easy, but then it's actually getting all the processes in place in order to make this uh, mass production part that is the challenge. So 
There's the, the concept phase, which I just described of, okay, well, a trigger keeper be cool, that kind of thing. Then there's the design phase, actually designing it, doing all the engineering, the finite element analysis. These need to be this strong. How are we going to build this? What materials do we use? All that stuff. And that's the army of engineering guys that do all that. Once the design is final, then it gets, then it gets handed off to the development team. And the development team basically has to figure out how to build these things in mass production. And we're building these cams in Salt Lake, so that's relatively, I don't want to say easy, but we can run downstairs, work on the manufacturing line, figure out what kind of tooling we need, how many cams we can pump through this manufacturing line in a day or in a week or in a month. So that's the development phase, is how do we, how do we actually build this thing? At the end of the development phase, even a little bit before, one thing I always kind of forget is the amount of testing we do. We do so much testing from the design through the development phase of a new product, because at the end of the day, you know, we, we're, you know, it's, this is PPE, personal protective equipment. So we got to take this stuff super seriously, and these need to be certified. So we create a whole battery of tests that these products go through, and mainly our QA team is working on PPE stuff, but they're also doing tests on jacket zippers and Velcro and headlamp buttons, you know, that kind of stuff too, trekking poles. But they focus a lot on the personal protective equipment. So all of these iterations and prototypes need to go through this testing phase in order to get approved for the next phase, basically. And then at the end of the day, when the design is done, the development is, is done, we make a, a pilot production run, those need to be certified and they get sent to Europe to get their CE certification. So even after a product is finished, once you have a production run of cams, you're still testing the individual units too, right? Yeah, so in production, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, so th that's a gr great question. <clears throat> so even to this day, like most, almost all of our PPE goes through some level of production testing. And there's three kind of branches of production testing. They are raw material testing. So the cable, for example, for cam, it'll come in and we'll test the cable to make sure just in its raw state that it's going to meet the strength requirements that we need in the finished good. Then there's work and process testing, and that is midstream during the manufacturing cycle. There are certain tests that the cam has to go through or any product has to go through in order to allow it to get to the next test to make sure machines are set up correctly, the strengths are right. And then there's finished goods batch testing. Finished goods batch testing, if there's an order of 500 cams, we'll grab three of them and we'll destructively test them till they, till they break to make sure that they're meeting the strengths that, that we require. And that's a really tough job for a first out of school engineering kid to have is to sit down at a tensile tester and ham a bucket of cams and tell them to break them all. You see the tears come down their eyes. It's super hard to handle, but it's critical. As well as that, all of our PPE goes through what's called 100% proof testing. Carabiners, for example, they all get pulled to half the rated strength in closed gate. Cams all get pulled to half their rated strength in this fixture just to make sure that everything is swaged together correctly, the cable's good, all that stuff is good. So there's a lot of testing, whip testing, raw material testing, whip testing, batch testing, and 100% inline proof testing. So a lot of testing, not only during the development of the product, but also the, the finished goods when it's actually in production. What's usually the breaking point of a cam? What's, what's determining the strength of it? What do you think it is? I think it is the, uh, the cable. It is the cable. So if you look at a black diamond cam, this is pretty interesting actually. If you look at a black diamond cam, the way that the sling is sewn onto the thumb loop, it's double thick there. And the reason that we, it's double thick is with a, single, with a single sling there, the cable would pinch down and basically act like scissors and cut the sling at a rating right around just a little bit less than 10 kilonewtons and we wanted some at 14, some at 12. So back in 2004, we did the double width, the double thick sling so that it would break there. Now these new cams, I haven't been in the lab to see where they're breaking. They're probably, they're probably all still breaking there. The cable is breaking, the sling isn't cutting. The cable is breaking there. Now it gets a little wonky when you get really little teeny cams because like our X-Force, the little, little X-Force, the sling won't, the cable won't break there. It'll break like at the cam lobe. And on say a number six, depending on how much you have it retracted, uh, the number six can, uh, the lobes can buckle before the, the cable will break, depending, but if it's a really good type placement, it'll probably break at the cable. 
What are the products that you are the most proud to have brought to market while you've been at BD? Oh man, I mean honestly everything. I mean I'm I love the cams. I think when somebody says Black Diamond, name a product, they think of the Camelot. That's that you mentioned it earlier. For sure. Um, that is the go-to piece for me. There's lots of things that I'm I'm super psyched to have been involved with the Cobra Ice tool, which was back in 2007 or so. I love that tool. I still climb on that in the Alpine. Some of the packs, the Creek 50 pack, the harnesses. I mean, our, our teams are doing so much. We have these dedicated teams, which is really great. We have a harness team that all they work on is harnesses. We have a trekking pole team. All they work on is trekking poles. We have a headlamp team. All they work on is headlamps. So having these guys just churning out products and girls churning out products. And as they're learning new stuff, maybe something that they're learning doesn't go in the product they're working on right then, but it can go on a product they're working on down the road. Yeah, it's just awesome to be part of all the, the latest and, and greatest stuff, for sure. Can you think of any magnificent failures that never made it to market? You know, anything that you really wanted to work, maybe some cool new piece of climbing pro, but it just oh. could, didn't come together? Um, there was one piece of gear that was really crazy that somebody pitched to us, and we, we didn't think it would ever make it to market, but it was really cool. It was this funky cam-type device for ice climbing where you would... If the ice was only, say, 10 centimeters thick and you, you put an ice screw all the way through, this device, you would put it into the hole and then a lever would like, boop, and it would act like a, a dead man in an, an ice screw hole. It was really cool, but it was way too sketchy. And there was no way. I was like, whoa, that thing is sketchy. So we never took that to market. We never intended to take it, but it was really, really cool. I'd be scared to death climbing on that thing. Yeah, it sounds, sounds kind of like a Batman Something he'd pull off as you show Exactly, <laughs> exactly. You mentioned a little earlier that one of the things you have to keep in mind is, uh, you know, just the business side of whether or not a product is going to make money or not. Uh, and I'm curious, and I asked you this a little bit when we were in Innsbruck together in September. I mean, there are a lot of items in Black Diamond's line that probably don't make a profit. Like, Yeah, they don't pencil. Yeah, we do a lot of products that make no sense. Yeah, so yeah. why does Black Diamond keep, say, rips in the line? Exactly, <laughs> and, that, and that's a super good question. And the reason is, I mean, it's a lame answer. It's because we're Black Diamond. Like, we're founded on aid climbing and that kind of thing. It's important to the culture and the core of BD to remain true to our roots. So we're going to have portal edges, and we're going to have rips, and we're going to have beaks and all this stuff that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. We're going to have heated chalk bags because it's cool. You know, we need to do stuff like that. Now, so part of my job is to balance the products that are actually going to make us some money with the products that are really way, way back and way more niche but we all want to use, you know. And we're working on some crazy niche things right now that make zero sense financially, like from a true business perspective. But luckily, we are big enough that we can, we can dabble a little bit in those arenas and have some fun with some cool little products at the same time as making a little bit more consumer products. I'm glad you brought up the heated chalk bag, Colin. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Announced on April 1st, everyone was not sure if it was a joke or not. Yes. And then you guys made a production batch of them. Yes. And so they sold out in the first day. Sold out. Mm -hmm. Everyone's like, oh, I guess it wasn't a joke. Right. I've had the Black Diamond email alert set up for that thing for months. It has not been back in the line. So now I'm like, was it a joke the whole time? Because it's the middle of winter and I need to heat a chalk bag. And I can't get one. So, yes, we made 500 of them. They did sell out the very first day. And we have 500 more coming at the end of February. Maybe okay. it's 1,000 more. But, yeah, a huge uh, positive response to that. We had been working on that project, you know, kind of on the side. It was a classic example of a product that doesn't make a whole lot of sense financially. But we've been playing with it. I've been climbing. My wife and I have been climbing with prototypes of that for the last couple of years. And then we thought it was a really uh, opportunistic to launch it on April 1st and confuse everybody. And to this day, still, people still are not sure is it true or not. Well, it's real, and it works really well, and it's cool, and we got more coming. So, And we're going to keep it in the line, and it's only available on our website. Yeah. Okay. I will buy that the first day it's back in stock. Awesome. <laughs> so... You've been working at BD a long time, yep. and the sport has changed kind of rapidly in, say, the past 10 years. With the gym boom, just a lot more people getting into climbing. I'm curious if 
the shift in the sports demographic, more new people, has changed Black Diamond's focus at all? Uh, or, or driven the way that you've, where product innovation has gone? I don't think it's changed our focus. It's, al it's almost like it's broadened our focus. Uh, years and years and years ago, when gyms were just kind of starting, even when I was there in, like, in the early 2000s, we didn't really talk about gym climbers much at all. We were making cams and ice gear and stuff like that. We knew people climbed in gyms, but we weren't really aiming at those people. But now, climbing in a gym is a real thing. Like, high-end climbers climb in gyms. Uh, First-time climbers climb in gyms. People train in gyms. Gym climbing, it's like a thing. Obviously, there's gyms blowing up all over the place. So we have acknowledged that in the last, you know, many years now. And we need to make sure that we provide the gear not only for the aid climber that wants the rope or the heated chalk bag for the person trying to send the proj at the VRG, but for the first time climber going to the gym and for the pro climber training in the gym and for the Olympic hopefuls, you know, we have Olympic hopefuls on the black diamond athlete team now, you know, 10 years ago, no one would ever even thought that the Olympics and climbing was going to be together, you know? Yeah. And I meant to ask you this earlier, what kind of climbing are you psyched on personally? Uh, well, I'm old and injured, so I think my sport climbing days are pretty much over. I'm mainly more of a like a mellow alpine climber guy, just up in the hills. I go back home to the Canadian Rockies, to Alaska. I mean, I do it all. I do nothing well. I don't boulder too dangerous for an old guy. But uh, yeah, ice climbing, alpine climbing, some mellow track climbing, and then sport climbing as hard as I can manage without blowing out an elbow or something. So a little bit of everything. Looking back, what are some of your favorite routes you've done? Uh, my favorite route of all time is the Becky Chenard in the Bugaboos. That's without a doubt. I mean, of course, it had to do with the, the conditions. No one was on the route. I was with my wife. It, we were the only ones in there. It was a bluebird day. We just had the perfect day. So definitely the Bugaboos are a special place for me. Nice. So I don't have many other questions for you, but the one thing I wanted to do before we go is I have some product ideas here, and I want you to tell me why they're either good ideas <laughs> Or great ideas. I'm I'm ready. I get lots of I get lots of good and great ideas. So let's go. Okay. First, cam shoes. Cam shoes. Interesting. Right. So Interesting. let me let me explain. You know how when you're climbing a finger crack and you put your foot in it, it really hurts. It hurts. Yeah. Yep. And so Black Diamond makes shoes. Also makes cams. So you have a cam where the head of it extends from the front of the shoe. The trigger is inside the toe of the shoe. Whew. Get up to a finger crack. Flex your toes, open, close the cam, or open, I don't know. how. how yeah, we, retract the cam. Re, retract the cam. Put it in there. Put it in there. Stand up on it. Nice little comfy platform. Pretty good. I mean, at some point, we're going to be bordering on aid climbing, right? I mean, do, like, you, where do, do you wear a sticky rubber, where, Colin? Oh, I know. Do you, like, use, do you use chalk? Where do you draw the line? I know it's the, the unanswerable debate. Cam shoes. We'll put it on the list. Okay. Okay. This idea is kind of extension of the hot forge heated chalk bag. Okay. It'd be like a chalk bag but it'd be like a little oven, right? Okay. So you have this little bag that you wear on the back, on your back, and you're going up a multi-pitch route, heats up to maybe 300, 400 degrees. Whoa. You got some biscuit dough in there. Ah, Top interesting. Top out, fresh biscuit. I like it. Yeah, that's possible. It's possible. Market's maybe not huge. But Everyone could... likes biscuits, Colin. <laughs> that's true. Tell it to it's, Popeyes. It's the extra weight. It's the weight. It would need to be weightless. If we can do it weightless, we could do it. We should do it. Okay. On that note, uh, kind of similar idea, edible helmet. Edible helmet. So when would you eat it? Like when you get back to the car? Well, you know, it's going to depend on the kind of route you're climbing. If you're wrapping off, you're not going to eat your helmet at the summit. Right. You still want that helmet for when you're right. rolling. I think it's more for uh, uh, tall walk-offs. I see, yeah. Let me explain a little first. Um, helmets, hard outer shell to deflect rock fall, soft inner shell. Sounds like a cookie or a donut or something. Or bread. Oh, mm -hmm. a bread helmet. Yep. Possible. Yeah, that's not bad. That's not bad. Shelf life would be tough. You'd have to have, you know, you'd have to almost uh, make to order, like, kind of thing. You know, you couldn't have it sit on a store shelf for months and go bad. Yeah, that, that's a good idea. See, these so, are things we need to think about. Yeah, so yeah. you get, you, um, you have bakeries at the entrance to every canyon. Oh, I out see. Bread helmets. So now you're talking about a whole other business model. Yeah, like a, like a food truck making helmets as you go like El Porto or Chico would be perfect. Yep, there you go. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so okay. we got that one. Slam like dunk, it. I'm going to say it. Um, <laughs> better shoulders. You know how like human shoulders, they kind of suck and they hurt a lot? Yeah. What if there were better shoulders? 
That'd be tough. That's like biomechanics wise. I don't know if we have the crew on staff. We could we could augment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we could get there. That's possible. We got some smart folks. We could figure something out. Okay, my last idea, psychological protection. We already make that. <laughs> <laughs> we, 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 make, we make that in the RURP that you mentioned earlier. <laughs> a couple of those pieces. Yeah, I'm a big fan of psychological protection. Uh, it's, a lot of it depends on the terrain. Some of the ice routes that I do, it seems like I'm putting some stuff in and it's all mental for sure. I was thinking more more in the along the lines of uh, like a piece of gum you could stick to the wall and clip a carabiner or two, but you're, you make a good point. Yeah, we have some of that stuff that's a little exciting already. Okay, uh, that's all the questions I have. Is there anything else you cool. wanted to add, Colin? No, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Good to see you again. It's been a while. Likewise. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for right. talking to us. Perfect. Thanks. Well, that's the conclusion of the show. I want to thank Colin Powick for joining us. Theme music was provided by Small Houses at smallhouses.band. And stick around after the show for a bonus interview and performance with Jeremy Quentin of Small Houses. This episode was presented by Black Diamond. You can check out all their iconic gear and great content at blackdiamondequipment.com. If you haven't already, please subscribe to Basecamp wherever you get your podcasts and leave a rating and review. That's it for the regular show. See you at the next Basecamp. Okay, well, that's a good place to start. So let's let's introduce you to the audience. I'm here with Jeremy Quinton of Small Houses, the artist behind our theme song, which is taken from his new song, which he's on tour supporting right now. He was just in Denver last night. He's performing here in Boulder tonight. The song is called Safe Kill. And what's the name of the album that you're releasing? Uh, I don't know what's safe. It comes out on February 8th. So I don't okay. know when this is coming out. So that might have been last week or This is going to come out now. March 13th, probably. Okay. So about a month ago. Yeah. You guys, <laughs> <laughs> it's probably not even going to be a thing anymore. Yeah. I'll, I'll have a two day sort of hype period okay. and then we'll already forget about it. But you no, know, it comes out February 8th, uh, 2019. Uh, it's recorded in Austin, Texas. And uh, the song I use for the podcast, well, I gave you pretty much half the songs off the record. You pick yeah. Safe Kill. Yeah. But we got rid of the words, we got rid of the background vocals, uh-huh. and then kind of enter that, put in that fade in, fade mm-hmm. out for you. And it's funny when I listen to your podcast because in my mind, it's totally different. Totally. Yeah. Totally different. And uh, almost. Actually, I, I think maybe people would like it more if I sung a little less, but <laughs> <laughs> I, I really like it in the podcast. Yeah. I do. Well, and also it's just solely outside like uh, my realm of, I guess, just ordinary thought what, what's happening in the climbing world. Sure. I, I love hearing that song come in. Yeah. Nice. So we're going to have you perform the song, yeah, acoustic style. But mm-hmm. before that, sure, sure. I want to talk to you about... 24 hours of horseshoe hell. So yeah. back in 2014, Arkansas. In Arkansas, ja- yeah. just outside of Jasper, Arkansas. Mm. You showed up. I actually hired you to perform. I don't know if you had ever really been exposed to climbing before. None. But <laughs> but 24 hours of horseshoe hell is a pretty intense event. <laughs> it's pretty unique even to uh, you know, the rest of the climbing community. I mean, mm. this is an event where climbers are climbing for 24 hours straight. Yeah. Yeah. They're dressed like Neanderthals. They're sure. dressed like superheroes. They're sure. in the underwear. Yeah. They're, you know, partying hard. Yeah. It's a it's a pretty unique event. I mean, what was your thought when you got onto the ranch there? I mean, were you just like, what is going on? Well, <laughs> what did I an, get myself into? As an, outs- uh, an outside perspective, I noticed, it's funny that we did that, and then I noticed the uprising of bouldering gyms Mm -hmm. within, I'm going to say eight months later, I started seeing this. Because there is a trend towards climbing, you know, and it makes makes sense to me. It's, you know, I like jogging every day, but, you know, I think a lot of people are bored by that, and I don't know, it's a a funner form of exercise, I guess. Yeah, well, even that night, later that night after your show, you even got bouldering a little bit. I got bouldering with some. <laughs> I tried. Well, I remember when it was just you and me. You know, yeah. I wasn't doing that bad. <laughs> you were phenomenal. <laughs> You're an excellent athlete. And then there was the then there was the V one. That was like the first mm-hmm. stage one that we were setting all the lights up to. And I was not able to get past the first step because it was immediately <laughs> upside down. So here's the question: Have you ever climbed since? No. No, okay. No. And 
which is funny because I live right next to a bouldering gym. What's kept me from going in there is the hundred and fifty dollar a month. Okay. Uh, subscription. And it's not fee. the calluses on the fingers. Because I know a lot of musicians who have climbed in the past, and uh-huh. they kind of feel like they have to choose one or the other. No. Yeah. Because, really? yeah, Oh, my gosh. Just because of the stress you're putting on your fingers yeah. and the skin on your sure. fingers, and then to also be plucking steel strings, ah. you know, they're they're kind of uh, working against each other. That's a th- that's, This is the thing about musicians uh, and why you're not it's not very common that you find athletic musicians you also hear musicians talk about how uh, oh they can't get a dishwashing job because they have to maintain these calluses or fingernails out there <laughs> <Yeah>. belly <laughs> yeah. okay they so we've ruled out exercising and we've ruled out work yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i just don't believe them at this point yeah, 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 yeah. No. <laughs> that's awesome Okay, well, let's, uh, you know, let's hear you perform the okay, song. Okay, I can sing a song. Mm. Check, check. All right, I'll give it another shot. That cuss comes by and everything shakes Oh, how the hurry come It's so quiet, I can barely make it out Yeah, same three O's and a souvenir bleed Yeah, book out and a violent hum I'm and I'm so glad you The door pulled back, a freckle leaned in. With that whole smile and aerial eyes. That aerial I say, but that's the end, the end, the end, the end. I don't need it, that's best about me. Stay, stay. Shine to tell you right flinch You're kneeling over with the sun behind You're trying not to tell what face I was But it's best if I don't know what I am Yeah, catch you, catch you, flesh your eye The kind of cuss I hold you up Door pulled back, a freckle leaned in With that old smile and aerial eyes That aerial I say, but that's the end The end, the end, the end I need it, that's best about me Stay, stay, to wish I'm gone I need it, that's best about me I say it Safe kill to hurt me some. 